Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radio detectives. Before we get started, I want to encourage you as you make your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. Johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate. So when you make your travel arrangements there, it's just uh, going through Priceline. Part of your purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio. So remember, when traveling, check johnnydollarair.com first. Now it's time for the very last Bob Bailey episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, November the 27th, 1960, The Empty Threat Matter. Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is George Reed. Well, hiya, George. How's dear old Floyd's of England these days? If you read the Wall Street Journal, Johnny... If I what? What? Nothing. Just keep talking. Plutocrat. Well, according to the financial reports, the leading insurance companies are doing better than ever. Uh-huh. And I'm proud to say that Floyd's of England is among the leaders. Does that answer your question? So, as head of the North American office, the company has given you a big fat raise. No. And you'd like to celebrate by taking me out to dinner tonight. No such luck. Just name the time and place and I'll... What'd you say? Listen, Johnny, you'll get far more than a free meal out of this. And you are available. Completely. All right. I have a problem, a rather unusual one. Have you ever handed me one that wasn't? Of course I... Well... Never. So what's it all about? Well, I fully realize you're somewhat averse to acting as a bodyguard. Uh-uh, George. But I assure you, this situation is somewhat unusual. You said that. Therefore... And it doesn't change my feeling about these bodyguard assignments. At least come over here and talk about it, will you? Oh, sure, if you're willing to pay my taxi fare for nothing. For nothing, eh? That's right. We'll see. Oh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> CBS Radio brings you Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Floyd's of England, North American office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the empty threat matter. These so-called unusual problems George Reed handed me were all too often dangerous. But it's a living, and so far I've been lucky. So, expense account item one, $1.10, taxi fare to his office at Floyd's of England. Come in, Johnny. Sit down. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I'm glad to see you. Glad you could make it. Well, I'm not so sure I am. What's it all about, George? Charles Stockerly is our client's name. He's a retired attorney. Ah, and somebody that he sent to the pen has got out now and is gunning for him. Mm, Possibly. Yeah. Where does he live? He doesn't. Hmm? You want me to act as bodyguard for a dead man? Well, I mean, he, he has no regular address. It's like this, Johnny. Yeah, please, let's get on with it. Uh, Stockerly had a highly successful career right here in Hartford. Married, brought up a couple of adopted youngsters. All in all, managed to live the good life. Except perhaps for the fact he worked too hard. So? Now, mind you, I don't mean to imply that he ever went off his rocker, but when his beloved wife died a couple of years ago and was that worthless, hateful son of his still around to worry him... Adopted, you say? Yes, both young Andrew and his married sister, Joyce. She's a wonderful girl, by the way. Mm, So what about him? Nothing. I simply mentioned them in passing. The point is, Mr. Stockerly has quite a bit of insurance, which is why he didn't hesitate to contact me regarding these apparent attempts on his life. Uh, you kind of punched that word apparent. Because... When he first told me about this thing, considering his extremely upset and nervous condition, well, frankly, I didn't take him too seriously. Uh, Is he an older man? In his early 60s. But now, apparently, and I use that word again, these threats have become very real, which is why he's been running away. Running away? Well, I told you he has no permanent address. Now that he's demanded your protection, that you stop whoever is trying to kill him, if somebody really is. All right, where is he, George? At the moment, in Tahiti. Tahiti? Yes, living in the seaport town of Papaete. Well? Uh, George. Yes? I don't want this job, no one bit. Oh, now, Johnny. But, uh, I'll take it on. For just one reason. Yes? 
All my life, I've dreamed about someday seeing Tahiti. (laughs) Item two on the expense account includes $8 plane fare Hartford to New York City. $785.30 to the Fiji Islands. Then we'll call it a total of $850 for plane tickets and a handful of incidentals. It took over a full day of flying for me to reach the town of Nandi on the western shore of the little Pacific island of Viti Levu. But it was a lot better than a couple of weeks aboard a steamer. Another hop took me across the island to Suva. And there, well, it's picture postcard country, all of it. Vast, heavy tropical forests. Millions, billions of beautiful blossoms everywhere. Picturesque South Sea villages full of thatched huts. Palm-lined beaches. And the magnificent clear blue water breaking over reefs of coral. The people, fascinating. Many of them East Indians. The women dressed in saris. The men wearing large white turbans. And there were plenty of the native Fijians with their wild, wiry, bushy hair that seems to stand on end. From Suva was an overnight flight to Papeiti in a flying boat. A lot of travel time, a lot of expense, but certainly worth it. Tahiti, with its black sand beaches and coconut palms. It's... Tremendous carpet of tropical foliage and flowers from the shoreline back to the mountains. The soft, almost caressing climate. Oh, yeah. It's really an ideal place to get away from it all. Sound nice? You want to go there? Well, it made me want to stay there. Yeah, it's the one place I found where I could really completely relax. And I made up my mind to take the fullest possible advantage of it, job or no job. I learned that Mr. Charles Stockley, the man who'd sent for me, lived in a small bamboo house near the water's edge within easy walking distance of the hotel where I'd registered. But my nice idyllic dream was quickly shattered when I found him there. When I found what was left of him. To paraphrase Gilbert and Sullivan, an announcer's lot is not the happy one. Well, not always. Want to know why? Tell you why. Take this safe driving business. Do you have any idea how many times my confreres and I have begged on bended microphone to have begged people not to kill themselves on the highways? Now, once and for all, let's get together on this. Let's understand one another. Unless you want a pack of frustrated announcers on your conscience, slow down and curb highway carnage. If you don't care about yourself, at least have a little consideration for us. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dr. Lee. First one minute, please. Yeah, sure. He is, Mr. Stockley? Uh, no, I am Dr. Bentley. Oh, well, I'm Johnny Dollar, a special investigator that he... Is that Mr. Stockley? Yes, it is. What happened? Who did this to him? Is he still alive? Uh, yes, Mr. Dollar. He's resting as a result of a sedative I've given him. But he looks as though he... All right, what happened to him, Doctor? He was up on the side of Ka Abu Mountain gathering flowers on a long and treacherous ledge oh. when he noticed someone following him very furtively. Oh? Apparently, this someone did not wish to be seen by him. He kept getting closer and closer, but always in hiding. Go on, Doctor. Then Mr. Stockley realized it was someone there with no good intent. But as he sought to escape, stepping gingerly and carefully along the rim of the ledge, yeah. he... Uh, he isn't certain exactly what happened. He, he's quite sure he didn't slip. Uh-huh. Rather that he was shoved by this uh, someone from behind a bush. He fell about 60 feet down through the tangled brush and remained there overnight. Now, if one of the natives hadn't found him early this afternoon... But uh, he isn't sure he was pushed off there. Oh, he's quite certain of it. And that the man, the person he saw up there, wasn't just somebody else uh, gathering flowers. Mr. Dollar, if it weren't for his exhaustion, and, of course, the sedative I have given him, he would have fled this island immediately. You see, he's a very nervous and, uh, I might say, apprehensive man. Look, do you know of anyone who might want to harm Mr. Stockley? Oh, certainly not, sir. Uh, Mr. Stockley, in spite of his nervous affliction, uh, a constant kind of fear, I would say. Yes, I know, I know. Why, he is one of the most highly regarded... Well, I, I'm certain that no one, white or native... Yeah, okay. Now, uh, how long do you think he'll sleep? Oh, until sometime late tomorrow morning. All right, then I'd better plan on bucking down right here. Um, tell me, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? 
Do you think that he is possibly in danger from someone? Maybe. Maybe not. We'll see. When I told the doctor my job, he was completely cooperative. Helped me improvise a bed near Mr. Stockley's, and he had some food brought in for me. That and his fee for the care of Stockley came to $9. I, uh, I didn't get much sleep that night. Every completely harmless sound around that little shack got me up with a start. Had I known what the morning was to bring, I might have asked the doctor for a sedative for myself. Promptly, at 5.30 a.m., Stockley woke up. He was so worried, nervous, and excited, I thought he'd gone completely off his nuts. It's no use, Dollar. We've got to get out of here, yes? We, we must get away before he finds me again and kills me. So he left on the morning plane. But it wasn't until we changed at Suva, then at Nandi, and finally started that long leg of our flight across the Pacific towards San Francisco that he calmed down long enough to tell me what it was all about after a lot of irrelevant chatter about his family. The death of my darling wife back in 1958 upset me terribly, Mr. Dollar. I confess I became a nervous wreck. Temporarily, that is. If it hadn't been for our adopted daughter, Joyce, a wonderful girl, I'd have lost my mind. You, uh, what about your adopted son? Wasn't he any help? Andrew? Oh, never. I've given Andrew everything, Mr. Dollar. Too much. Education, money, investments that'll keep him wealthy for life. Bad mistake. He's never done a day's work in his life. Yeah, well, now... Much more, he's never shown the slightest sign of gratitude for love for his sister. I see. But Joyce, who asked for nothing in all her life, who worked to train herself, to support herself, and is now married to a fine young man. Mr. Starkley... Joyce has been nothing but a joy and comfort to me. About these threats now. That is why I never worried about the... Threats? Yes. They've been more than that. They've been attempts upon my life. Like the one you nearly witnessed there in Tahiti, where I thought I'd finally found safety. From whom, Mr. Stockley? From whom? From whom? At home in Hartford, when I tried to tell the police, they wouldn't believe me. I suppose perhaps because of my nervous condition, but but it must be Harry Linker. Linker? Yes, Linker. Years ago, I had him sent to prison. He swore he'd get even with me. Oh, oh but look, don't they all make that uh, kind but of But what threat? do the police say? That he's reformed now, that it must be someone else. But I knew he'd come back to kill me, and he has. Oh, now listen. First was threats over the telephone, right after Martha died, as I was about to leave for Europe. Ah, oh. and when you left, he stopped bothering you? Stopped. It was in Paris that I heard from him again. It was in Paris, Mr. Dollar, that I narrowly escaped being run down in the street and by an American car. But now look, So Mr. I fled to London. And I should have known better than to walk the streets there alone at night... But it was there that only the intervention of a Bobby kept me from being murdered by him after another warning. But, Mr. Stockley... In Jakarta, more threats. I found a poisonous reptile in my trunk. In Stockholm, I found the scorpions in my briefcase just in time. Oh, now, please, and look here, I've Mr. Stockley. I've run and I've run and I've run, but he's kept coming after me. He attempted to poison my food, I'm sure Mr. of that. Mr. Stockley... And there in Tahiti... Uh, yes, yes? Look... Every one of those things could have been coincidence. Coincidence? So please, until we have some proof this man Linker is chasing you around. The doctor, the doctor told me that unless I am able to stop this mad flight, I'll kill myself. Perhaps even deliberately. What will I do? Where can I go? Well, right now we're heading back to the States, back to Hartford. But if he's following us... Then maybe we'll find some proof against him. Proof? Proof? By having me killed? Look, you'd better take another of those pills the doctor left for you. And you, you'll stay awake to protect me? Yes, I promise. Coincidence? Why, sure it was. There at the San Francisco airport when the baggage truck ran out of control and almost hit us, almost hit him. Anyhow, I practically had to hold his hand on the rest of the trip to Hartford. There I piled into my car, drove straight to my apartment, gave him a key and had him go upstairs and wait for me while I put the car away in the garage at the back. It took me three trips up those stairs with the luggage, but then... Ah. Ah. There we are. All set. Aren't you going to lock the door, Mr. Dollar? Oh, please, now. Don't worry. I've sprung the catch. Hey, did you pull down all those shades? Of course. Of course I did. Oh. Look, as I told you on the phone, until we get some proof that this... Ah, uh, here now. Ah. Uh. There, this place looks a little more cheerful. Holy... There, there, do you see? Now, Stockley... What's the matter with you? Get away from that window. He thinks you're me. Oh, no, please, listen. That must have been some kid with a little 22. You... Oops. 
Now, now, do you believe me, Mr. Dollar? I, uh, yeah, you got a point. Catching a cold? Well, I guess most everyone knows that the smart thing to do when you feel a cold coming on is to get plenty of rest. But there are some days when no matter how miserable you feel, you just can't stay in bed. And if tomorrow is one of those big days and your cold is complicated by constipation, well, that's when you'll appreciate X-Lax most. You see, X-Lax has the qualities doctors consider most important in a laxative. It's gentle, effective, and close to natural acting. Taken at bedtime, X-Lax won't disturb sleep. It works effectively overnight, to help you toward your normal regularity. And X-Lax is so close to natural acting, there's no upset or discomfort. So gentle, it's even recommended for children. So, if tomorrow's a big day for you, if you have a cold and need a laxative too, take X-Lax, a laxative with the qualities a doctor would recommend. X-Lax. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the empty threat matter. I carefully dug one of the 38 slugs out of the wall, wrapped it in a handkerchief, then put in a fast call to Bill Peters, who was not only a good doctor, but, well, I told him to pack a gun into his medical kit. He arrived in short order and did what he could to quiet Mr. Stockerley's nerves and agreed to stick around. He'll sleep a little while now, Johnny. Good, good. But listen. Yeah, Bill? Did you hear him? You know, he's not kidding. This old coot's gonna take the leap unless we can... Suicide? Wouldn't put it one bit beyond him. Believe me. This whole business has him in pretty bad shape. Oh, that that just doesn't make sense, Bill. Because he's been trying so hard to run away from this uh, killer or supposed killer. Well, sure, sure he has. And if he wanted to die, he had... brush up on your human psychology, boy. Okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. Now, if you'll stick around, I'll get this bullet over to headquarters. I'll be here. At headquarters, they gave me the story that Stockerley had said they would. A few years in the clink had changed Harry Linker. He was living a model life, running a store right here in Hartford. I called on Linker at his hardware store, and I i must say he convinced me that he was behaving himself. He was even quite concerned about Mr. Stockerley. Offered to help us if he could. I called on Stockerley's adopted daughter. Then I told her the whole situation. Oh, this is a terrible thing, Mr. Dollar. I know, I know. If only Daddy told me so I could have done something to help him. Well, as soon as we clear this thing up... I'll go to him right away. No, no, just uh, wait, please. He needs me. Well, you can probably help your father more than anyone else in the world, but not right away. But you'll let me know the minute we can bring him here and take care of him. Yes. Now, you're, uh... You're sure your husband would agree to that? Of course. Yes, of course he would. Oh, good. That's all I wanted to know. You don't think my husband could be behind this? Why, Ed feels as much affection for Daddy as I You'd do. You'd uh, better answer that phone, hadn't you? Oh, yes. Excuse me. Hello? Why, yes, he's right here. Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Johnny Dollar. I've been calling all over for you. This is Bill Peters, Johnny. Yeah, Doc. Listen, that, there was a phone call right after you left. Oh? Uh-huh. Stockerly was awake, and I made the mistake of letting him take it. Yeah? He listened for a second, got as white as a sheet, and then started yelling, uh, no, no, you'll never get me. Go on, Bill. Then he slammed down the receiver and made a dive for the window. Bill! It's all right. I caught him in time. Oh. I gave him a stiff hypo, and, well, that's it. Johnny? Suicide. What's the matter with me? I tore on over to George Reed's office at the insurance company. Here you are, Johnny. Our copy of Mr. Stockerley's policy. Yeah, good, good, good. All right. Well, let me see if As I As you'll this. note, his adopted daughter, Joyce, is the sole beneficiary. Yeah, yeah, I see. But... Andrew, the adopted son, is specifically omitted. Irrevocably. 
So if you think he might have anything to gain by Mr. Stockerley's death, you're wrong. Uh -huh. Look, look, here it is. The suicide clause. Well, of course. All right. So maybe Andrew couldn't get any of Stockerley's money. But if that old man killed himself, neither could Joyce. And believe me, Andrew would love that. Oh? So, these attempts on the old man's life, were they? Were they really? What? Or were they just part of a long, drawn-out, careful campaign to drive him off his rock or make him kill himself? But if that's Can true... anybody prove that Andrew actually tried to kill him? No, no. In spite of all sorts of opportunity, and with plenty of money to follow him all over the world, to plague him, to worry him, to... All right. Where does he live, George? Andrew, I mean. Have you got his address? Well, yes, I... Then give it to me, quick. Travel stickers, huh? On all this luggage. From all the places Mr. Stockerley has been. Yes, I suppose I should have taken them off my luggage. Mm -hmm. They are going to hang you, Andrew. Do you think for one minute that you or the police can ever prove I actually tried to kill my foster father? Because I didn't. Maybe they won't need to. Now, just a minute. Maybe this is one time I'd better take the law into my own hands. No, Dollar, stand back. Oh, yeah, I see. But you'd better let me have that gun, Andy. So the police can compare it with the slug I dug out of the wall. What? What? This is the gun you used to throw a couple of shots through the window of my apartment. That was your apartment where he went? That's right. But it was you who drove him over there in the car. That's right. But you left him there, and I, I thought... Just long enough to put my car away. And I'm the one who almost got nicked by those shots of yours. And I don't like that, Andy. Stand back, I say. You better give me that gun. No. Because if you try to use it now, you will be in trouble. Listen, Dolly. Yeah. Andy, you And you jump. All I hope is they lock that bird up for the rest of his life. And that somehow Joyce and her husband can bring the poor old man back to normal. Expense account total, hold your hat. It's $2,561 even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Constipation is something people don't talk about much. But it can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. While a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, Exlax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because pleasant-tasting chocolated Exlax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. Exlax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use Exlax with complete confidence. Exlax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity gently, overnight. Star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a story of real intrigue, plus a couple of the most intriguing characters I ever met. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey. Originates in Hollywood and is written, produced, and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, G. Stanley Jones, Ben Wright, Ralph Moody, Harry Bartell, and Carlton G. Young. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. You're tuned to Radio 590 WROW in Albany, New York. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. 
check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, probably to start with the shortest part of the commentary, the episode has an interesting uh, premise. Even though Johnny starts out a little slow and somewhat reluctant to believe Stalkerly, it definitely presses him to his limit. Some might ask if this is a worthy finale for Bob Bailey as Johnny Dollar, but it's important to keep in mind they didn't even do real series finales at this point. In most cases, I think the only radio show that did a full-on finale was uh, Candy Matson. I think in terms of overall quality, it's a fair representative of Bailey's era on the show. It's about at the same level as most of the uh, Bob Bailey, Johnny Dollars in the uh, half hour era, and certainly better than quite a few of them. Of course, it's important to keep in mind that Johnny Dollar was recorded about three weeks in advance. This ensured they had a product ready to go in case uh, an actor took sick, particularly Bob Bailey. If there was a problem, you could just uh, reschedule around it. And so, because this was already recorded, you couldn't really change the uh, including remarks by either actor or announcer who weren't going to actually be there next week. So it's definitely a very abrupt switch to the next actor, but it's that way by necessity of the technology of the times. The series would move to New York primarily as a cost-saving uh, measure because that's where CBS made all of its uh, daytime television shows. Suspense would also move to New York. And you would see a very New York-centric cast and hear the last of the Hollywood regulars who really served as a company for the show for more than five years. And the same would uh, go for suspense. Bob Bailey was reportedly offered a chance to go with the series to New York, but declined, partly for family reasons. I think, too... That however you sliced it, the golden age of radio wasn't going to last much longer. And to move across the country for something like that doesn't make much sense. The Bailey era is considered by the vast majority of fans to be the best of Johnny Dollar. And with good reason. Not all of it has to do with Bailey, of course. The series has access to a company of some of the greatest uh, character actors in radio, who during the height of the golden age were brought out over multiple networks, but with less work could be much more easily had on a regular basis on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In addition, Jack Johnstone's creative strengths stand out in the series. Most detective programs of this era and for years to come would have very little in the way of continuity or even in consistent recurring characters. And John Stone was probably ahead of his time by at least a decade and probably more. You probably have to go to the 1970s and a character like Jim Rockford to find a character who is more fleshed out and developed uh, than Johnny Dollar. In terms of uh, supporting cast and consistent likes and dislikes. But of course, Bailey was vital in this effort. You can know facts about someone, but not really care. But showing the strength of one of radio's true greats, he imbued Dollar with a great de deal of likability, despite his faults. The faults were, after all, part of the picture. Bailey's radio acting career had the great highlights of Let George Do It and Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And surrounding it were a bunch of mostly forgettable guest appearances. Johnny Dollar really shows him at his best. In my mind, the serial era of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar 
is the most magnificent chunk of radio programming that you can listen to for dramatic acting and overall production values. While there are some individual episodes of other programs that are true standouts, for just the sheer quantity and quality of the Johnny Dollar serials, I don't just don't think it can be beat. And after that, we're still a very good program. Does some very different and unique things that really made it connect. Indeed, there's somewhat of a mini generation for whom Johnny Dollar was their radio detective, particularly the Bob Bailey version. After 1955, Johnny Dollar was it if you wanted to listen to a radio detective with just a few exceptions that were on for a few months. And as we've heard, so many armed forces radio and television service rebroadcasts, these continued to be uh, rebroadcast for years after the series went off the air. As I've stated on previous occasions, Johnny Dollar during this era is plagued with quite a few lost episodes. Thankfully, we have most of the episodes that were produced. But as of this recording, there are 26 missing episodes from the Bob Bailey half-hour era, which is far more than the Spence and Gunsmoke, who were producing programs every week just like Johnny Dollar during this era, but are each only missing one. I hope that means that somewhere out there, there are most of the missing episodes of this uh, series with Bob Bailey, because certainly this remains a series that uh, we'd like to hear more of. Of course, we should make clear this is not the end of Johnny Dollar. We didn't pretend in the pre-Bob Bailey episodes that the series didn't exist prior to Bailey, and we won't pretend that it didn't exist after Bailey. And I've listened to a few programs from these next two actors to take on the role of Johnny Dollar and found they bring something to the table and perhaps took a few cues from Bob Bailey. So we will uh, begin the Bob Redick era next Friday, and but join us tomorrow for Dragnet. If you do have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.